Okay, so I thank the organizers for inviting me. And as you see, I, I didn't have a title for this poor, poor heat talk where I will try to uh, share a lot of information with you. But uh, I will start with a story, just a wake up story, okay? We have, when we think of energy, we think of coffee break, right? And if we think of coffee break, of course, we think of pão de queijo. And uh, I don't know if you noticed, but when I was a kid, there was no pão de queijo everywhere. And this is because the polvilho, the grain, could not be frozen. And this was an, uh, a research developed in the University Federal of Viçosa. So they found a polvilho that could be frozen, and this is why we have uh, so much good energy for, for our meeting now. Okay, so I start sharing with you some information about my uh, institution, just because I want to share the, uh, uh, what I think is our targets, our goals as uh, an institution, okay? So the UFMG is a university of uh, around 3,100 professors spread on all the fields of knowledge. I don't expect you to read what is here, but this pizza just show you that you have people from music to engineering in all the fields. Okay, and uh, this is the number of papers published by year. And so we are increasing as every, uh, uh, almost all the institutions in the world, Brazil increased significantly in the last 20 or 30 years and we reached a number of publications that is reasonable when we think of our uh, uh, number of researchers in the world. And we are also worried about uh, uh, improving quality and improving the level of indexation of our papers, okay? And when we see this, uh, if we compare this number with our host university, with Unicamp, Unicamp is a little bit higher than this, and it's mostly a reflex of the fact that Unicamp is more technological than uh, UFMG. UFMG is, uh, has some 30% of researchers that are in human science, and the way they publish is different from ours. But in any sense, we look for improvement of quality and uh, uh, world, uh, tech, uh, worldwide uh, publications. And these also, if you look, for example, the number of papers we published on nature and science. Okay? If you go be, be, before, in the, like in the last century, before the year 2000, this was very rare. And now we start to have some five to ten papers published on nature and science every year. And this is the increase on the factor H of the institution. So we are aiming at high scientific impact. And this, of course, turns out into innovation. So this is the number of uh, patents, okay? And this is the number of uh, money that you get from technology transfer. And it's interesting to look, for example, if you compare from 2005 to 2015, the number of papers about double the, number, uh, 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 the numbers, okay? If you take the number of patents, it multiplied by five. If you take the number of technology transfer, it multiplied by 10. So this is the direction that we are taking our institutions. And I have here a comparison on the evolution of the number of patents versus the number of technology transfer, because doing patents without technology transfer is just a waste of money. Uh, for the squares here are the UFMG, the triangles are, let me call the Unicamp our uh, national uh, uh, benchmark, and MIT, MIT as a national, as an international benchmark. If you if you were in this line, you would be uh, making a, a transfer of all the technologies you produce. This line is a transfer of uh, for ten patents you make, you transfer one, and. Going on, developing here is a stable development and jumping from one, per, one line to the other and reaching here means a more, uh, 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 let's say, the innovation environment is rich and enables you to do the job that you want to do. So this is uh, what I want to share with you about our institutional view. 
And uh, I now go more into my uh, uh, contribution to the fields of energy, mostly. And this is just uh, the, the web page of the laboratory I work that's called Laboratory of Nanospectroscopy. As I will show you, basically we try to use light to study materials to do metrology, quality control, and scientific development. We have this kind of diagram that uh, is, has been introduced with the, the quadrants. This is the level of uh, uh, scientific level, and this is the level of, let me say, importance to society, okay, as, as economic or, or uh, utile. And we have energy here, and we want to push energy higher. Of course, energy is very, very important, but we want to push it higher to the more scientific uh, perspective. And this is the reason for this, uh, uh, this uh, scene. Okay, and why energy? Uh, we like to make a plot of the number of papers published in our field. And then we see, oh, do you see how it increases? This means my field is very important. Actually, everything is exploding in the world. Okay? It's not only your field of research. If you take population in the last century, it multiplied by eight. If you take uh, uh, by seven, sorry. And this reflects on worldwide consumption of energy, and it reflects on something that is even harder for us, that is the information explosion. So nowadays, if you want to keep track of the number of papers that are published in your field, it's hard. So is this sustainable? And from the point of view of energy, this is very critical. And this comes together when you look on the economy, world economy. The economy has, uh, th there is these uh, uh, economic cycles that have been uh, uh, identified by a, a, a scientist, a so social scientist named Kontratiev. He, he shows that we have cycles where our economy grows strongly and then retracts. And these cycles are usually related to the uh, to the industrial revolutions. The first one is the uh, uh, vapor industrial re revolutions. And the last one is related to information technology. And we are now in this deep here. So if you wonder why so many crazy politicians are doing strange things in the world nowadays, it's just because we are here, okay? And as scientists, what society expects from us is to do something to push this up again, okay? So this is our role. Okay, so from this I, I go back to my small world where I have been trying to, to, to give some contribution. So some, this paper is from 2009, so some 10 years ago I was working at eMetro, which is our National Metrology Institute. And we used a lot of techniques, like uh, weight change, Raman FTIR, uh, many spectroscopies, atomic force microscopy, etc., to learn what biofuel does, or if you compare uh, 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 diesel with biodiesel, how do they harm metals where they will be uh, either the containers that have or the metals in the engines. And we used many of those, and for example, in this case, we showed that the lowest uh, weight loss was related to the uh, biodiesel made of soil, in, the, in, in this case. On the same, uh, 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 same direction, we analyzed the Raman spectra of the compositions of different biofuels. If you do that, you can generate a software that reads an unknown spectrum and tells you if the spectrum you have from a sample is the NIST standard that was developed together with eMetro, the standard for, for uh, soil biofuel, or if it is something else. And you can, from some ana spectroscopy analysis, you can say if in the uh, gas station someone mixed uh, what, whatever kind of oil with the oil that should be there clean for, for being used in the, in the engines. We had a, a work that we developed with uh, IBM, and 
the IBM in Brazil, they were, uh, the IBM in Rio de Janeiro, they are interested in finding ways to extract the pre-salt oil and gas with low expen expenses on energy. And these, uh, the, the oil is very mixed with the rocks, so the interaction of the surface of the of the oil with the rocks gives you uh, the, the difficulty to extract this from the pre-salt. So what we did was using our nano tools, basically spectroscopy and some other tools, to, to understand the interaction energy of droplets, droplets with the surface. And with this study, we wanted to find this is still going on, some ways to reduce the interaction between the oil, in this case this is just a cartoon, but between the oil and the rock, so that extracting the oil from the pre-salt region would be uh, easier. Okay, here is another uh, application we have. You know, Brazil has minerals everywhere, and the state of Minas Gerais specifically is here nearby Sao Paulo. Here is the state of Minas Gerais. The name already says it's full of minings, and we have this state company that it's controlled by the state, but it's open to, to the market also. And recently, they launched, recently means some three years ago, they launched an important project to take the graphite mines uh, Minas Gerais already sells a lot of graphite for, to Japan and to many other places to be used for producing lithium-ion batteries and, and, and others. So instead of selling the graphite as it is, we would transform the graphite into graphene, so you would uh, enrich the value of the, the mining, and you would sell graphene and sell solutions, may, uh, uh, solutions for, for, for specific problems with graphene. So they created this company that's ca called Neographene and they have three products that they already sell. Product A has one to five layers, is mostly two layers, and they sell as good for sensors, supercapacitors, refractarios and, and uh, textile, textiles. Product B has more layers, thermoplastics, composites for mechanical and conductivity properties, revesting, and uh, nanographite, so these are larger, above 10 layers, that is good for lubricants, plastics, uh, uh, and batteries, etc. And on this, the way they do, did this, they, they installed a, a power plant in the... Uh, CDTN. CDTN is the Nuclear Energy Institute that is close to UFMG. And w what we are doing with them is, so they have this power plant to produce graphene, and what we are doing is we installed a system that is on the line because the production is you take the graphite from the mine and, and you do uh, uh, liquid phase exfoliation. So they have a tube with this material flowing and we want to measure during the production, we want to measure the Raman spectrum that will tell the number of layers that, that will tell and control in real time the number of layers that they produce in these liquid exfoliation uh, uh, machines. Okay. So we, are, we built this project for, for, for this, uh, this uh, project of the graphene state uh, uh, company. So uh, we have this, in, in general, when we think of nanographite, our problem is very much on knowing if you have something very ordered and nice like this, or if you are in the other extreme. Okay, And of, you have from lithium batteries down to amorphous carbons, a lot of applications on this, on this aspect. And uh, here we base our knowledge. I, I put this slide here because of a question of a student yesterday. Okay, so uh, they wanted to know why the Raman band is splitting two here on when they manage their graphite. So there are the knowledge related to ion intercalation, if it's in every layer or every two layers or every three layers. These are cal called stage one, two, three, etc. graphite intercalated compounds. And this knowledge is 
started to be developed in the 70s, 80s. Also, on the quality of graphite that you can see from Raman spectroscopy, this uh, signature of, uh, we say, the intensity of the disorder peak with respect to the graphene peak, this is largely used by many, I saw many presentations here where they would look for this aspect. And what we are doing with, uh, in, co in, in collaboration with Emetro and some other institutions is trying to make this thing very well stable, very well understood. And basically when you think about defects on a two-dimensional system, this two defect can be like points, like uh, a, a vacancy or a functionalization, or they can be grain boundaries in nanocrystallites. And we developed a methodology based uh, fully on Raman spectroscopy. Here is the average uh, between the D and, and G peaks that is usually uh, is studied, is like this. And this is the width of, of the peaks, okay, one of them. And you generate a phase diagram that you, if you have points on this place, it means you have only grain boundaries. If you have points here, it means you have point defects. And if you have anything in the middle, you have a sample like this. So we, when you develop this kind of thing, you can understand very well the material you are dealing with. And this has been applied in many uh, 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 fields. And one that I want to call your attention that we also worked here and I like, I find it very interesting, is this called uh, Indian Black Earth or Terra Preta do Indio. Uh, the Indians, they changed the soil. If, it's, if you take here with Raman spectroscopy, you can characterize many kinds of soils that uh, uh, have carbon. And what the Indians did, they changed the soil in the Amazonia to improve the quality for fertilization and for ag agriculture. And this was done before, uh, uh, before the Europeans uh, arrived. So you find many sites in the Amazon where the soil is like this rather than like that. This is a very poor soil that we learned. If you remove the soil, it gets, uh, 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 it, it gets like a desert. And this is a very good soil for agriculture and it's very stable and it's related to rejection, rejects that they burned and put into the soil. So what we did, we did a, a Raman-based experiment, ba fully based on this uh, picture, and we learned what was the specific structure for these materials, and we are, we are working now on taking uh, left material from sludge, from many things, and trying to make a treatment to generate this kind of carbon that you find here, and you could put back in the soil, of course, also uh, uh, worried about contaminants and not other things that you could find on this ledge and other trashes. Okay, and uh, one of the reasons why we use a lot of Raman spectroscopy is if you think of the amount of information you get from the technique and together with how easy it is to do the experiment, because this is very important, we see that Raman spectroscopy has this advantage. Okay, you, uh, any sample that you put inside uh, your microscope or whatever without any preparation, you can get the information. So this allowed us, uh, in, after the, the, this, the beginning of this century, to start to do like nanotube spectroscopy at the single level or in, uh, graphene nanoribbons at the sing single level also. But there is a limitation here. And the limitation, sorry, uh, just to show that, uh, of course, this is not only about carbon, okay? Uh, I study a lot of carbons from my perspective because carbon is a very good material as a, for, the, for a prototype, as a prototype for developing uh, the, the technologies. But you can apply to any of now recently very well uh, studied to the materials. But there is one aspect also that if you probe here again the amount of information with resolution, then in this sense optics is not too great because optics is uh, limited to the diffraction uh, uh, effect. 
which limits you on a resolution that is in the order of one micron, or uh, to be more specific, lambda over two, where lambda is the wavelength of light, that is usually hundreds of nanometers. So in this sense, there is a technique being developed that you mix Raman or IR, we heard about this uh, also in this, tech, uh, in this uh, conference, with scanning probe microscopy to generate the nano-optics. So nano-optics would be a very important technique because you get to real nanometer resolution with all the information and facility that you have from optics. And the way you do it is basically, if you have two emitters that are too close together, you cannot differentiate the information from them because of the diffraction. But if you are able to approach a nano antenna and strongly enhance the signal from this emitter, then you can move this antenna from here to here and visualize that one was red and the other was green, okay? So we have been doing this, and this is a uh, tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which is not nano-IR, it's nano-Raman. Here is an, a, a regular AFM image of a nanotube serpentine, and here is the corresponding Raman image. And the difference you see is, you know, in, uh, in microscopy, you only see if there is something there or not. So there is something here, but there is also something here. And I know this is a nanotube because I know I put it there. But otherwise, you would have no information. But when you do it with a spectroscopy, you also have the spectroscopy information. So at the end, the information you have is much more rich than what you can do with uh, uh, microscopy. And you can go to the level of, this is one nanotube, and this is one uh, nitrogen atom doping the nanotube. And you can image the, the luminescence or the disorder emission of this single uh, nanotube. And to develop this technique for, for Raman spectroscopy, we had to improve significantly the, the tips that we use to do the enhancement. And the tip we have now is produced based on silicon uh, uh, technology. Okay, so we do patterning on the silicon and we evaporate gold and we generate a tip that, is resonant, that has a plasmonic resonance with the excitation laser. And with this kind of technology, we have now available tip-enhanced Raman that has the uh, efficiency that one needs to do, for example, this is a piece of graphene, okay? And we come uh, with a helium gun, and you make cuts on, on the graphene with a helium. And of course, if you take this square here that is 800 nanometers, and you try to image this square with uh, optics, Raman imaging, you will not see anything specific related to the lines because this is about the size of the laser spot itself. So it doesn't matter if you uh, keep moving here, you're moving a huge spot. And when you try to look into, okay, uh, uh, what is the defect here, you will see something that is average. But then if you land the nanotip here and you scan with the tip, you see that this image becomes like this. Okay, so here the material has been completely sputtered. Here the material has been uh, uh, destroyed, uh, destroyed a little bit, and here the material is more pristine. And then you see that with a resolution given by Nano Raman, you don't see a distribution that's like this, but the distribution of defects is much higher. Some regions have very low density of defects, and some regions have very high density of defects. And of course, again, this is not only for, we like graphene, carbon nanotubes, because these materials are very stable, but you can do this kind of metrology of uh, characterization with any two-dimensional or uh, one-dimensional system, etc. And here is a demonstration of the Raman signal without the tip, and then when you land the tip in, on top of MOS2, the signal enhances significantly, and you can do imaging, and, and you compare this image with this one, and do all the sort of information that we uh, that you can extract with Raman spectroscopy. And 
once since you have a tip to enhance the local signal of the material, you can also do nano manipulation if you want. So this is one analysis where we had a nanotube, and what we did was we used the tip to press the nanotube and make it uh, oval, okay? And we analyzed the mechanical properties. And here is an example where we moved, we land the tip here and push it up, so the nanotube bends like this, and the bending here makes a strain that propagates all over the nanotube, and you measure this from the Raman frequencies, which are related to strain. So you can, with this technique, you can also do this kind of uh, uh, nano manipulation and probing. And since we developed this thing, on, these are, this is a result of a, almost 15 years of research in our group, we have now a, a, a project with the state agency together with two MRP uh, units, one from Salvador and the other from UFMG, where we are taking this uh, equipment that now is just a laboratory prototype and we are trying to develop a, an equipment that can be uh, uh, commercialized. So this would be the commercialization in Brazil of uh, an, an, an instrument for research, okay? And finally, I get to my final topic. Uh, if you look into the Raman spectrum, we always call the elastic scattering, the Rayleigh scattering as zero, and usually we only look for what happens, sorry, to this side that we call the Stokes shift. But we also have uh, mirror information on the other side that we call the anti-Stokes shift. So this side is when you destroy a f uh, an en a vib vibrational energy in the material, and this is when the light actually gains energy from the material. And the reason you have less intensity here than here is because usually the intensity depends on how much phonons or how much the material is vibrating for this side and here not. So what we are doing is exploring a very interesting and important effect here that's like this. Okay, so this is uh, what we call Feynman diagrams in, in physics, where you have a photon and this photon is uh, transformed into a phonon, into a vibration in the field, and another photon ha that has less energy. This is the Stokes shift. But you also have the process where the, pho the phonon is actually annihilated in the process, and the light goes out with more energy. So this is the Stokes and the anti-Stokes processes. And this process depends on having this phonon, and this is related to boson statistics and, and things like this. So in the 70s, there was a Russian professor, he proposed that this kind of process could happen. So this is a process where the same phonon that is destroyed in one process, is, uh, that is created in this process, is uh, annihilated here. And when you do this kind of things, you generate correlated photons, and these photons are correlated with some information inside the material that is uh, vibrational. And the point, and this, this is the reason why I bring this here, this places us on the condition to study quantum thermodynamics. So the, from the point of view of quantum mechanics, there is a lot of information that you can also transform in energy that is lost when you lose the quantum limits and you go to the classical uh, f uh, life, okay? So we are studying the thermodynamics of these effects, of this correlation between photon and material to, to understand quantum uh, 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 thermodynamics. And the way we implement this experimentally is, uh, is not complicated, okay? This is a usual Raman spectrometer. You just have a laser, you illuminate the sample and you send it to, to, to a spectrometer. This is what we usually do in our labs. What you have to do is to change your laser into a more fancy laser that is, uh, has pulses that you control the time. And you have to change your CCD camera by photocounters. 
So when you make these two changes, you are instrumentally in the level of doing quantum optics or quantum uh, uh, studies on the quantum thermodynamics, as, as we say here. So with all this material, I, I try a big summary here, okay? So generally what we do is we use light, a lot of Raman spectroscopy, not only, but a lot of uh, inelastic light scattering to access nanomaterial properties for finding solutions to our present. And by present is like the study of our, uh, the NIST uh, uh, biosoil uh, reference material, etc. Near and far future, and in far future is, for example, watching the quantum thermodynamics effects to see if we can really have some jump into the use of energy in our world and perspective. And with this, I thank you for your attention.